Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Book 2, Part 3, Section 3 of his Treatise on Human Nature, David Hume is going to present his rather controversial views on the capacity for reason or rational faculty, including the understanding to provide some sort of motivation or direction to the will, which is the faculty of choice, which then leads to action. And David Hume is going to oppose his view to what we might call a, a standard position or standard view that he takes pretty much everyone prior to him to have espoused in one way or another. So here's what he, he says. Nothing is more usual in philosophy and even in common life than to talk of the combat of passion and reason to give the preference to reason. Now, what does that mean? To give the preference to reason, it means that we evaluate ourselves in terms of whether we are following rationality and whether we have developed our rationality. Insofar as we have, we're virtuous or good. Insofar as we're not, perhaps we've developed it, but we're not following rationality, we're bad or vicious. And he goes on and says, um, every rational creature, tis said, this is by the standard view, is obliged to regulate his actions by reason. So you should do the sorts of things that, that everyone else who's a rational being would likewise do. Your motivation should be rationally explicable to other people. They should be worked out in a rational fashion. And, and you should stick to that. And he says, um, if any other motive or principle challenge the direction of his conduct, he ought to oppose it till it be entirely subdued or at least brought to a conformity with that superior principle. So if I desire something that I know is irrational, like, say, a fifth helping at a meal that's been going on for two hours or to, you know, drink myself into a stupor or, you know, any one of many other things that is really, you know, from some respect irrational, I should follow what reason says and I should use my force of will that reason has informed to, you know, impose itself upon that unruly passion and say no, no to it. Now, Hume says that really doesn't work. Why? Well, he tells us that he's going to prove two things in this section. One of these is that reason alone can never be a motive to any action of the will. Now, that word alone is very important. He's not saying that reason doesn't play any role in motivating our will, but reason alone cannot move anything. And in saying that, you know, he's not completely original because Aristotle said something sort of similar in the De Anima in claiming that mind by itself doesn't move us to action, but it has to have orexis or desire or appetite, however you want to translate it, uh, working as well. So that's one thing that he's going to prove. He says also that it can never oppose passion in the direction of the will. So if there's reason saying one thing and passion saying another, the will is actually going to be motivated or directed or oriented, however you want to put it. It's going to be determined in favor of what the passion is suggesting rather than what reason is suggesting. Here we're mostly interested in this discussion about why it is that reason alone can't be a sufficient motivator to the will. Why can't knowing something or understanding something by itself be enough to make us do something or to refrain from doing something? 
So Hume has this distinction that he makes between different ways in which we are working with and connecting ideas. And he talks about two main types of reasoning here that he's considering. And he says the understanding exerts itself in two different ways as it judges from demonstration or probability. Demonstration, what he's calling that here, has to do with what he calls the abstract relation of ideas. So mathematics provides a perfect example of this, but we can think of many other uh, types of things as well. Logic, the definitions in language, these are all abstract relations of ideas. And these don't motivate us to action by themselves. They're never, he says, the cause of any action whatsoever. He says, I believe it scarce will be asserted the first species of reasoning is ever the cause of any action. Its proper province is a world of ideas. The will places us within that of realities. Demonstration and volition seem on that account to be totally removed from each other. Now, that's not to say that the things that we do by this, for example, mathematics, couldn't be useful in the world. He says mathematics are useful in mechanical operations, arithmetic in almost every art and profession, but, but they don't have any influence by themselves. He says, gives you an example here. A merchant is desirous of knowing the sum total of his accounts with any person. Now, is this an idle curiosity? He just wants to have the numbers straight. Why does he want to have the numbers straight? Why does he care about that? Well, because there's something more than mere abstract reasoning going on, he actually wants to be in the black, as we say, instead of in the red. He wants to be able to spend his money. He perhaps looks forward to retirement or a vacation, or perhaps he's angry at somebody who hasn't paid back his, his debts. So he says, abstract or demonstrative reasoning never influences our actions, but only as it directs our judgment concerning causes and effects. So insofar as it helps us figure out the relation between causes and effects, it might have something to do with action, but by itself, it doesn't do anything like that. What about reasoning about matters of experience? What Hume calls here probability or in other places, moral reasoning, you know, the, the sort of reasoning about getting things done or avoiding something. Here, he says that we're looking at things that involve pain and pleasure, and pain and pleasure in a very broad sense. He says, it's obvious that when we have the prospect of pain or pleasure from any object, we feel a consequent emotion of aversion or propensity. We, if we think that something is going to be painful or damaging to us, we want to stay away from it. We're averse to it. If we think that something is going to be pleasurable for us, we have a bent towards it that in other places we can call desire. So desire and aversion, pain and pleasure. Now these are what Hume calls emotions or passions, or we might say, broadly speaking, affectivity. So he tells us it's obvious that this emotion does not rest here, but making us cast our view on every side comprehends whatever objects are connected with its original one by the relation of cause and effect. So, you know, let's use it childhood examples. I place my hand on the hot object that's glowing red and man, that hurts like hell. And I say, I'm going to, I'm not going to do that in the future. I see that other burning plate over there. I'm not going to touch that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to sit over here quite far away from it. I pop some candy in my mouth and I like the taste of that. And I say, there's some more candy over there. How about I go help myself to that? And I, that motivates me to action. And in doing so, there's kind of a natural tendency, but we can also reason about that. We can employ our faculty of reason or understanding to try to produce more experiences of that sort and to think, you know, out in advance, wait a second. This might be one of those sort of things that looks good, but is actually quite painful. I'd better mull this over. So he says, reasoning takes place to discover this relation. According as our reasoning varies, our actions receive a subsequent variation. But as he says, in this case, it's emotion, not reason, that is providing the impulse that is determining 
our will. Reason is functioning like a sort of tool, a very high level, uh, capable advanced tool, but a bit of tool nonetheless for the desires or passions or emotions that we are being driven by. He says that, Tis from the prospect of pain or pleasure that the aversion or propensity arises. These emotions extend themselves to the causes and effect of that object. How? Insofar as they are pointed out to us by reason and experience. So we do engage in some investigation. Reason can point out the causes and effect. It's going to have to rely upon experience, of course. If it's not, it's merely doing this reasoning about abstract relations of ideas, and it can't go very far according to Hume. De- demonstrative reasoning can't really do that. But this, this sort of causal or moral or probabilistic reasoning can actually take us quite far in understanding causes and effects of what makes us feel good or makes us feel bad. Um, So he says, when the objects themselves, though, don't affect us, then their connection can never give them any influence. And it's plain that reason is nothing but the discovery of this connection. Because of this, it cannot by its means, uh, it cannot be by its means that the objects are able to affect us. So reason is not able to, on its own, produce a movement to or fro from anything. There always has to be some sort of desire, affectivity, emotion, passion, something motivating us already in the background. Now, he does point out a little bit later that reason can, in fact, help us out with with some things. He talks about uh, for example, the moment we perceive the falsehood of any supposition or the insufficiency of any means, our passions yield to our reason without any opposition. Uh, he gives an example. I may desire some fruit as of an excellent relish. That means it tastes good. But whenever you convince me of my mistake, my longing ceases. So, so reason which can help us figure out the means to satisfy the end of our desires can in fact tell us this object is not a good object for us to be desiring, but it can't tell us not to desire. We're still going to want the sweet relish of the the fruit. We're just going to displace it onto something else. Not that fruit, maybe that fruit, right? So reason by itself, according to Hume, although it's a quite powerful tool, it can carry out some very interesting, you know, rasin, uh, re, you know, some reasonable inferences and figure out the causes and effects and align means and ends and carry out all those sort of operations. It can't actually motivate us to choose something or to pursue or to avoid or even to value something. That relies on a different faculty of ourselves, the faculty that encounters and senses and remembers and deals with pain and pleasure, aversion and desire. So reason by itself can't do what the standard view wants it to do, according to Hume. 